pictures that they use and show how it's taken out of context and that e even when God was doing physical miracles through the Lord Jesus Christ when he was on earth here, the focus, uh, God's focus was still on the spiritual. He was still, when Jesus came, he didn't come just to do physical miracles, but he came so that people may be saved, so that they would believe the gospel and receive eternal life. And so now, now that we've covered that, what we're going to start tonight is we're going to look at, well, what does Paul say about prayer? You know, in Romans eleven thirteen, it says that Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles. And in 1 Corinthians 9, he says, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. So if we want to find out how we should pray today, we need to look at Paul's epistles, Romans through Philemon. And so tonight, we're just going to do a, a basic overview of some of the scriptures that, oh, where Paul talks in his epistles about prayer. And then next week, probably, we will get into uh, the, what I would call the, the major points and how we should pray. So to the, tonight is more of like a general overview for get us an idea of how Paul would say we should pray. So let's start in Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, the first thing I want to do tonight is look at three different prayers that Paul has uh, here in his epistles. And it gives you an idea of how it's prayers that Paul has for the churches that he writes to. So uh, if this is how, since Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles and he gives us the instructions for us today in the dispensation of grace then it makes sense that if we look at Paul's prayers, that would give us an idea of how we should pray. You know, if Paul, um, in 1 Corinthians 4.16, Paul says, Be ye followers of me. So if we look at how Paul prayed, then, the way we can, then we'll know how to follow Paul in the example of prayer. So in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 15, Ephesians 1.15, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith, <coughs> excuse me, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. So uh, now he's going to tell you in verses 17, uh, really all the way down to the end of the chapter, what he's praying for them. Uh, the first thing you see, he gives thanks for them, that they have the faith in the Lord Jesus, love unto all the saints. And then verse 17, here's the specific prayer, the details of the prayer. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling, and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him in his own right hand in the heavenly places. So you can see here, you notice what's not here. You think of what churchianity normally does when they pray for somebody. Uh, if I'm going to pray for somebody, usually it's, you know, they say, well, got a backache, or I've been, my allergies have been bothering me, or I've had an upset stomach, or, or I've got a friend who's got cancer, or I've got somebody who has got COVID, or, you know, they bring up usually physical ailments is what is brought up, and that's what people pray for. Um, sometimes people will pray for, you know, they'll say, especially in a church, um, where you have them take prayer requests, you'll hear somebody say, well, I've got a, a father, or I've got a brother, or I've got a daughter who doesn't know the Lord. And so we pray for their salvation. But usually when it comes to the spiritual, that's the extent of it, usually. Um, if you grew up in a legalistic church like I did, well, maybe we pray for somebody who's backslidden that they'll come back to the church. Uh, but you notice... Paul here, when he prays for the Ephesians, obviously they're going to have struggles just like us, physical ailments, people hurting in the church financially, people hurting 
physically. Um, they're going to have the same types of problems that, you know, we would. Uh, and yet, you don't hear anything in this prayer about the physical. It's all spiritual. He says, first he, in verse 16, he thanks God for them. In verse 17, he prays that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. So the first thing he prays for, that they get, um, they get knowledge, wisdom, revelation, um, the eyes of their understanding being enlightened. And the reason for that is because that they may know what is the hope of his calling. When you keep going in this, in this chapter, in verse 19, he prays that they would know the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. The primary reason Paul prays for them to get wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the sound doctrine built up in the inner man, is because... God used resurrection power to raise Christ from the dead, and it is that same resurrection power that is working to usward who believe. You notice it says in verse 19, what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe? A lot of times we don't really grasp that because in general we end up walking by sight and not by faith. So when when we have prayer requests in a church, you know, what to pray for, it's immediately, oh, I've got somebody, a friend who has cancer, or I've got this, this relative who has COVID, or I've got this, uh, you know, this, um, personally, I've got some physical ailment. And so then we, and then we end up praying for a physical healing for God to bring on their life. Well, let's say, you know, and we've already talked about how God concentrates on the spiritual and we've shown how the physical miracles aren't being done today like they were in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But even if they are, even if you do have a friend who, uh, let's say, has COVID, and certainly you don't want them to continue suffering with that. There's some people, you know, it takes, I've heard, take three, four, five months for some people to get over it. You know, it takes a, it's a long process and you don't want them to have to go through that. So you'd rather have them have an instantaneous healing. And if God did bring an instantaneous healing to that person, well, that would be great. But it's, whatever that healing is, it pales in comparison to the spiritual healing that you receive. It's like the example of the COVID. Well, the person... You know, as long as they have the right medicines and do what the doctor says, you know, rest and everything. Um, even if God doesn't heal them, they should recover from, have a complete recovery from COVID. But our problem, spiritually speaking, you see in Ephesians 2, 1, just a few verses later, you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. I got a bigger problem than COVID. Spiritually speaking, I'm dead in my trespasses and sins. I deserve to go to hell for my sins because the wages of sin is death. And there's nothing that a doctor or medicine or rest <coughs> or your immune system, no, there's no way of recovering from that. The only solution for that is Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. That's why Ephesians 1.19 talks about the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. A supernatural healing of COVID or cancer or a backache may seem, seem like great, that it's a great, wonderful thing. And it is something, you know, if, if that's what happens. But it is far greater that God takes someone who is dead in trespasses and sins, bound for hell. There is absolutely no earthly remedy for that whatsoever. Now, not even a relief from pain. It says in Revelation 14 that those who take the mark of the beast or worship the image of the beast suffer in eternal torment, and they have no rest day nor night. 
There's no respite from it. Someone who has a very painful physical condition, you may be able to take some medicine to get rid of that pain for a while. You know, if I have, let's say I have a real bad backache, um, you know, really bother me, I could probably take some Advil or something and I'd get some kind of relief from the backache for a little bit anyway. And then, of course, they've got stronger medications. The death in hell is torment with no relief from pain whatsoever. No rest day nor night. There is no medicine. Not only there is there no way for anybody on earth to be healed physically from this condition of being in hell, there is also no remedy from any or any relief from pain. So the far greater, and that's why we need to be focusing on the spiritual rather than the physical. Because the physical, like I said, somebody gets COVID, well, we could probably go to a doctor and get some medicine or, you know, the vaccine is out now. Or there's different ways of handling that to where, and your body with its natural immune system would naturally, you know, get over it after a while. But for when it comes to death and hell and the suffering there for your sin, there is no remedy. There is no temporary relief. So that's why it's called the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. And the first part of verse 19 says that to us, the exceeding greatness of his power is to us who believe. So right away, just learning that, you can learn that our focus should be on the spiritual. That's why Paul prays for the spiritual. Even if there is, and we're going to get to some physical sicknesses uh, later on today, and we'll, we'll look at what, how Paul addresses those. But, you know, even if someone is healed of some physical ailment, that's not that big of a deal compared to saving you from death in the lake of fire. And, but God didn't just save you just to give you eternal life. Like I said, a lot of times when prayer requests are made, if it is a spiritual request, usually it's for somebody who has never believed the gospel for them to be saved, for them to believe the gospel. It doesn't go beyond that. But in this prayer, you see the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, verse 20, which he wrought in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and set him in his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. The prayer really goes to the end of the chapter, because what Paul is doing when he start, starts talking about the power, the resurrection power in verse 19, it's not just to raise you from the dead, to give you life in heavenly places. The power is, as he says, Christ is set at his own right hand far above all these positions, the principality, the power, the might, and dominion. And so the reason that God gives you eternal life isn't just so you can be safe from hell, although that's a wonderful thing, but it's so that you can operate in the resurrection life in heavenly places in Christ. Christ is placed far above all these positions. Verse 22 says that, that God has put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, that's us, his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So what that tells you is that the power, the resurrection power that is in Christ raised him at the right hand of the Father, far above all principality and power. Then when we believe the gospel, that same power is working in us. And the extent to which it works in us is the extent to which we believe and get the sound doctrine in the inner man. Because the more sound doctrine we have in the inner man, the greater value we will have to Christ in heavenly places. So that when he, as the head, fills all these positions with his body, which is us, the body of Christ, the more sound doctrine we have, the greater use we will be in that body, in heavenly places. So that's why he's praying. When you go back then, in verse 17... He says, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, that's the glory plan that the Father came up with, 
in which he plans to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ in him and then glorify us in Christ. And to the extent that we get sound doctrine in the inner man, that brings greater glory to us, to Christ, and to God. So that's why he's praying that he may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. There in verse 17. Verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. The more, as I mentioned with churchianity, when they ask for prayer, if it's for spiritual, it's usually for salvation. They don't get into praying that you'll get the spirit of wisdom and revelation, that your eyes of understanding be enlightened, that you will understand the hope of his calling, that you will know the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And that is because they're focused on the physical rather than the spiritual. And the spiritual is so much greater because for two reasons. One is that a physical healing is temporary even if, it's a, even if you never have a problem with it again. You will eventually die. And so whatever healing you got really goes away at death. And so, but anything spiritual is eternal. Whatever you receive, the, the, to the extent that you have the wisdom and revelation, your eyes of your understanding being enlightened, the hope of his calling, the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, to the extent that you get that in your inner man, then that will last forever in heavenly places. And the second reason is, physically speaking, God has already built a body for you that has an immune system and there are medicines that doctors can come up with and uh, that you can come up with to remedy some of your physical ailments. But spiritually speaking, you can't do anything for that. It's only the Lord Jesus Christ who can give you spiritual healings from your ailments there. So for those two reasons, we should be focusing on the spiritual rather than on the physical when we pray. And that's why here in Ephesus, although I'm sure there were people who were sick uh, that had physical pain, ailments, uh, yet Paul isn't focusing on that. Because even though it would be great if God heals them of those things, it's far greater if he brings spiritual healing. And even though these people are saved, we saw from verse 15 that he heard of their faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints. He doesn't stop there. He doesn't say, oh, you're saved, you're going to heaven. Well, I won't worry about the spiritual. Tell me what's wrong physically. No, he says, that's just the beginning. You've received the exceeding greatness of his power to raise you from the dead, just like he did for Christ. But God didn't just raise Christ from the dead to give him life here on earth. He raised him from the dead and gave him life in heavenly places, and it's not just a position in heavenly places, but he is far above all principality, power, might, dominion. He is at the right hand of the Father. He is at the most highly exalted position in heavenly places. And so Christ then has the job to fill positions beneath him with us, the body of Christ. And so that's what Paul is praying for. This is spiritual. This is eternal. And the more doctrine that we can get in the inner man, the greater our capacity to fill those positions in heavenly places. So it's not just a, it's almost like, you know, a lot of churches have that health and wealth prosperity gospel. In a way, you could say that's what Paul is praying. He's praying for health and wealth, but not physically speaking. He's praying spiritually speaking. If it would be a wonderful thing for you being in the poorhouse to win the lotto, and to get a mansion and not have to worry about, you know, bills and things because you've got all this money, um, how much more would it be great if you had spiritual currency? Colossians chapter 2. In Colossians chapter 2 and verse 2 and 3. Colossians chapter 2. He doesn't say this is a prayer, but it looks like it to me. He says in Colossians 2.2, 2, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding 
to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So Paul does believe in the health and wealth prosperity gospel. He just believes in it spiritually speaking, not physically. You don't hear him praying that God will give you the winning the lotto or um, getting a mansion or uh, you know having great health and living to be 120 on this earth. He's praying for spiritual prosperity that their hearts might be comforted being knit together in love. That sounds like good spiritual health to me. And unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding. And verse 3 says, In Christ are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. That sounds like riches there. So you had the health part in the first part of verse 2, and the last part of verse 2 and verse 3, you have the wealth. But it's not physical, it's spiritual. So there again, his focus in Colossians 2, 2, and 3 is on the spiritual health and wealth. Now let's look over in Ephesians chapter 3. So here's another prayer. Uh, again, it doesn't exactly... Well, from verse 14, he says he bows his knees. So I guess from there you can say, you know, it's... In the context, it's a prayer. Uh, Ephesians 3, 14. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Again, you see him as the head there. Now, verse 16, here's the prayer. And notice again that he's not going to pray for physical. Verse 16, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory. That's what we read in Ephesians 1, the Father of glory. So you see his riches here, riches of his glory. To be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man. So he's praying for inner strength, spiritual strength. He's praying for sound doctrine, wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, as he said in Ephesians 1. He's praying for that. That, that way they're strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. In Ephesians 6 and verse 12, he says, We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the de evil day. So what is the whole armor of God? Well, that would be getting the sound doctrine. Because again, if I'm not wrestling against flesh and blood, and I'm wrestling against principalities and powers, and we see that Christ is far above all principality and power, and the way we have that is by getting sound doctrine in the inner man, then it's important that I am, going back to Ephesians 3.16, that I'm strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man. Spiritual strength. So again, it's a spiritual prayer. Verse 17 now, Ephesians 3.17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love. So again, there you see the health, spiritual health of the person, that they have Christ dwelling in them by faith, that they're rooted and grounded in love. And now verse 18, you're going to see the spiritual wealth, which has to do with knowledge or sound doctrine. Ephesians 3, 18, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. So comprehend, knowledge, breadth, length, depth, and height. That refers to the spirit realm. Knowing that structure, the principalities, the powers, the mights, dominions, and knowing how that operates based upon the sound doctrine in Paul's epistles. So I comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge. Over in 1 Corinthians 8 verse 1, it says, Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. So we need that knowledge to understand, comprehend the breadth, the length, the depth, and the height. But just having a theoretical knowledge of it doesn't really help because 1 John 4, 8 says God is love. And that glory plan where he plans to glorify, he plans to bring glory to his Son and then us in his Son, Christ, the only way glory comes from that is not about spouting out a bunch of doctrine or facts, but it's about God's love coming through us. 
so that when we are in heavenly places, it's about operating according to every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God found in Paul's epistles, operating by that, but doing it in love. Remember, knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. Just having knowledge doesn't really help. You've heard of you know, smart people, sometimes they call them a smart aleck, you know, because they know everything. Well, people don't want to really follow the instructions of a smart aleck, but if you've got love or God's love or charity behind it, that's what gets the job done. See, you've got to have the knowledge, but then you've also got to have God's love. And so he says, first, you can see the interplay between the two. In verse 16, you've got the knowledge by strengthen with might by a spirit in the inner man. In verse 17, you see that he's that ye being rooted and grounded in love, so there's the love. Verse 18, it goes back to knowledge that you may be able to comprehend. And now verse 19 says, to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge. So the love of Christ is built upon that knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Well, that's very similar to what we read in Ephesians 1, verse 23 which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. And so then if he prays in Ephesians 3, 19, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. God is love. So if I've got sound doctrine in the inner man and the love of Christ on top of it, that's how I'm filled with all the fullness of God, and that's how I operate to most effectively in heavenly places. The fullness of him that filleth all in all, that fills all positions in heavenly places with God's love, working perfectly through the body of Christ. Built upon knowledge, sound doctrine of Paul's epistles, with the love of Christ on top of that, and then each member of the body, as you, you know, with a body, for it to work correctly. My hand has to work correctly, as does my arm, as does my shoulder and my neck, and all the way up to my head. If anything is broken in there as far as the nerves are concerned and my head gives instruction to the hand, the hand doesn't do it because you don't have the instruction flowing all the way down there from the head to the hand. So the whole body has to work correctly. So that means every position in heavenly places, which is the body of Christ, must have the knowledge of God and God's love working through them as that body part should work. And so you can see there, that's why you've got knowledge and love, knowledge and love, and when all of that's working perfectly with the entire body, then it says in verse 19, Ephesians 3, 19, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. When we get to that point where Christ has enough people who have both the knowledge and the love of God working together to fill the entire body or to fill the entire positions in heavenly places, that's when the rapture takes place. Romans 11.25 says about the fullness of the Gentiles. Blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in, and then all Israel shall be saved. The fullness of the Gentiles isn't just a quantity, but it's also a quality. And so Paul is looking toward that eternal picture in heavenly places and says, I'm praying for you, Ephesians, that you will get the knowledge and you will get the love and that together then you will fill a position in heavenly places to the best extent as far as sharing God's love to this fullest capacity. And so as we get more and more people to do that, eventually the whole body will be filled up there and the rapture can take place. So you see the prayer there is all about spiritual, knowledge and love, knowledge and love. And then um, verse 20, Ephesians 3, 20, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. The power that worketh in us is not the power to heal somebody physically of their, their ingrown toenail or their cancer or their COVID or whatever it is. The one, one is able to exceed abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. That power that worketh in us 
is the sound doctrine, strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. It's the love of Christ upon that, charity edifying, working together so that we may operate correctly in heavenly places. And so verse 21, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. So when that prayer is fulfilled and you finally have all positions in heavenly places filled with the body of Christ with the appropriate uh, level of knowledge and love so that God's love comes out to its maximum so that there is glory to God the Father and Christ and us in Him, then there will be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. So you can see the prayer completely spiritual. And uh, one more prayer, Philippians chapter 1, before we get into some physical healings. Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, you can see the prayer here by Paul is very similar to what we've seen in Ephesians. Philippians chapter 1, verse 8. For God is my record, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. And this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. So there you see again, knowledge, but love abounding above the knowledge. Verse 10, that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. So again, you see the same pattern as these other prayers. You see love mentioned in verse 9, knowledge mentioned in verse 9, and that we need to be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. So that's when Christ gives us those positions in heavenly places at the rapture. And verse 11, you see the glory, that the fruits of righteousness are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. So the glory plan, love, knowledge, you see that all working together there, um, in these prayers. So again, what does Paul say about praying? Paul prayed for spiritual needs. He prayed for spiritual needs. So you say, you may say, well, what about the physical? So let's look at some of those. You're in Philippians. One of the big things when, you, when we say that God isn't physically healing people today, and when you understand how to rightly divide the word of truth, usually people go to Philippians 2 to try to make the argument that God is healing people physically today, and with the case of Epaphroditus. Philippians chapter 2, verse 25. Philippians 2, 25. Yet I supposed it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger, and he that ministered to my wants. For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness, because that ye had heard that he had been sick. For indeed he was sick nigh unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I send him therefore the more carefully, that when ye see him again, ye may rejoice, and that I may be the less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such in reputation. Because for the work of Christ he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life, to supply your lack of service toward me. So the argument is, Epaphroditus was nigh unto death, but God had mercy on him, so he must have healed him. So then God is physically healing today. Now we, we take the stance that there are physical healings in the dispensation of grace up to Acts 28. You can see that in the book of Acts. Paul goes around, and even uh, those who just... Uh, touch a, a, a handkerchief from a sick person is brought to Paul. And Paul touches that, and that person is healed. So there's a lot of healings, physical healings, that are done by the hands of Paul. Uh, but by the time you get to the end of Acts, and the argument that we present is that the spiritual gifts have passed off the scene once God's Word is completed. And we've gone over that before. And so when God's word is completed, then the gifts of physical healings are no more. Well, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians were written after Acts 28. And so when he's writing about Epaphroditus, and it says that he was sick, 
nigh unto death. We're told that both in verse 27 and in verse 30. But God had mercy on him. So the argument is, well, God must be physically healing today because this is after God's word is completed or after Acts 28 when we supposedly say that physical healings have stopped and here's a physical healing. So what do you say about that? Well, a uh, couple of things. First off, um, I've made the statement before, and I still believe it, is that the spiritual gifts had to do with a healer. So if you had the gift of healing, then you could do like Paul. Someone could sick could be brought to you, and you could heal them of that. It's the gift isn't the the gift is for somebody to be able to physically heal somebody else. We went over that. Jesus, sick people were brought to him. He healed them. The disciples, they went to sick people. They were healed. Peter, same thing. Paul, same thing. Uh, so that what we're saying is when the spiritual gifts pass off the scene, the gift of physical healing from a healer is gone. No one has the gift to heal anymore. But that's not what churches claim. Churches claim that people are healed by you pray for them and that person has enough faith to be healed or you have enough faith for them to be healed or what, whatever it is. Either way, it's through. It's not by someone who comes and heals somebody, but it's rather through God supernaturally doing it without doing it through a healer and then they're and they get healing that's for the most part what churchianity believes um, and so I have said that that is still possible because even though the spiritual gift of healing is passed off the scene doesn't necessarily mean that someone could not be physically healed but again that's not what God's focus is and uh, and we, so so for so when you look at the case of Epaphroditus, uh, if there was a supernatural physical healing of his, uh, it was not like what you see with Jesus or Paul or Peter or the other disciples. It wasn't where someone laid his hands on him and he was physically healed. Uh, it looks like this was something that happened just by the immune system uh, because just the key words. You notice whenever someone's healed, they'll say, the sick were brought into Jesus, he healed them all. Or someone was sick, uh, brought, Jesus cast the devil out. Or, you know, it's, it's definite. The language is, the person was sick, and they were healed. You're not told that Epaphroditus was healed. You're told, in verse 27, he was sick nigh unto death, but God had mercy on him. Okay, it doesn't say he was healed, he had mercy on him. And then in verse 28, he says, I sent him therefore the more carefully. Now, when you see healings, like, for example, Peter's mother was sick with a fever. And Jesus came and healed her. And then she got up and fixed him a meal. Fixed the, Jesus and the disciples a meal. When there is a supernatural physical healing, it's instantaneous. You know, then the guy who was at the pool of Bethesda in John chapter 5, he had, he'd been at that pool 38 years. He had been lame. When it, Jesus healed him, he got up, rise, take up thy bed and walk. He got out of there. He, it was instantaneous. Whenever you have something where someone is healed through a doctor or through the immune system or through the process of time, it's something that you, you, is a gradual thing. It's not instantaneous. You know, if I had the flu, and then I get over the flu, it's not that I'm down in the bed, sick, can't get up, and all of a sudden, boom, I get up, and I'm working, you know, a full 10-hour day at work. You know, I'm out building a fence or something. That's not going to happen. It's a gradual type thing. That's why I mentioned Peter's mother, is that she was sick, and then she gets up right away and cooks a meal for, for the whole group there. Uh, you know, if you're... If a normal physical, if you just get over it through the immune system or doctors or medicine or whatever, it's more of a gradual thing. And that's what it seems like here when he says, I sent him therefore the more carefully. There is no carefully part, like the guy who got healed at the pool of Bethesda for 38 years, hadn't been able to walk. Jesus didn't say, now take it easy at first. Don't be jumping up and down and leaping around and all that stuff. 
You know, you, you hadn't walked in 38 years. We'll do it a little slowly. Your muscles have atrophied. You ain't, won't be able to even straighten out your leg because you hadn't walked in 38 years. Take it slowly. See, he doesn't do that. He just gets up and walks because it's a full-blown supernatural miracle. But if it's something where doctors have done it or it's just the immune system or medicine, we always say, you know, take it easy. You know, don't go back to work after the flu and work a full eight-hour day. You're going to be worn out. You might have a relapse. The language here, I send him therefore the more carefully, is more like that. Like a, nat, not, a phys, not a supernatural healing, but it's, well, he was sick nigh unto death, but God had mercy on him. And now he's okay, but I sent him the more carefully. You know, I just wanted to make sure he was okay. So, and Paul, he's done plenty of physical healings. So he knows what a physical healing looks like versus what just a healing from a natural means. So um, in my opinion, just based on that language, it doesn't say he was healed. It said that God had mercy on him, and he sent him the more carefully. So to me, it sounds like just a natural type thing. You know, there have been people who have been at death's door, and it wasn't God who healed them. It was just their immune system kicked in, or they took the medicine, or it was just, uh, it was time for their body to recover. You know, that's, that has happened before. Uh, so that, to me, is what the Epaphroditus healing is, sounds like. And then if we go over to 1 Timothy chapter 5, we'll see, uh, again, a couple of instances here where after Acts 28, after the gift of physical healings is passed off the scene, uh, you can see what Paul says here. Uh, to these people. He doesn't say, oh, I'm going to heal you. In 1 Timothy 5.23, Timothy has stomach problems. And Paul says, drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine oft infirmities. So uh, use a little wine means you take it like a, like a cough medicine. A lot of times it has 10% or 20% alcohol in it. Uh, that alcohol content can be like a medicine to you. You don't guzzle down the whole bottle. You're not drinking a whole bottle of wine. He says, use a little wine. So just drink a little bit for that. And, you know, I've heard, what is it, whiskey and lemon put together, I think it is. It's supposed to be real good. Whiskey, lemon, and honey. Whiskey, lemon, and honey. There you go. A shot glass. Of and a shot glass. Yeah, you don't drink a whole bottle of Jack Daniels. You just get a little bit of whiskey, a little bit of lemon, a little bit of honey, put it together, and it helps you. Um, that's just a natural thing. If, if physical healings were continuing at this time, uh, Timothy had a great responsibility. The church there in Ephesus had some problems with doctrine, and Timothy needed to be well. I mean, it was a good spiritual reason for Timothy to be healed, and yet Paul says, well, you need to use a little wine for your stomach's sake. He doesn't say, I'm going to put my hands on you and you'll be healed. You go to 2 Timothy chapter 4, 2 Timothy chapter 4. In 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 20, possibly uh, the last words that uh, Paul wrote were uh, 2 Timothy. And it's the very end of his life. He just said just before that in chapter 4 that he said in verse 6, he says, I am now ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand. So it seems like he's about to, about to die here. So it's probably his last epistle that he wrote. And here in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 19, he says, Salute Prisca and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. Erastus abode at Corinth, but Trophimus have I left at Miletum sick. Again, the physical healings were continuing at that time. Uh, why wouldn't have he have healed him? And... Um, you know, why leave him there at Miletum sick? Trophimus was a, a good, faithful, um, you know, servant of the Lord. So why not get him well so he can continue serving the Lord? Uh, so um, we're... And let me just show you another verse and another reason why that Paul... If you go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, another reason why Paul didn't focus on physical healings in Ephesians or Philippians. And let's say that God is still doing that today. Let's say for argument's sake that the gift of healing is gone, but that there are instances, let's say, 
where physical healings could occur today. Where if you prayed and uh, the Lord willed that he would heal somebody physically. Let's say that's possible. Um, that may not be the best solution. 2 Corinthians 12, and 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7, And lest I should be exalted above measure, through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Remember we talked about how knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. He says twice there, lest I should be exalted above measure. Through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. It seems like from this verse that it is actually beneficial for us, spiritually speaking, for us to suffer physically. That if we had complete physical health and no problems, then we would be focused more on the physical rather than on the spiritual. Here Paul had the abundance of revelations. He had more sound doctrine in him than, uh, for the mystery dispensation than anyone else in alive. He had three years where he spent with Jesus. Then he was stoned and left for dead in Acts 14, and he was caught up into the third heaven, he says there in 2 Corinthians 12, 2. And he saw things that were unspeakable words in paradise there. He learned a great amount of mystery doctrine, and because knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth, to keep Paul from being puffed up in his knowledge, God allowed a messenger of Satan to buffet him, to actually hurt him physically speaking, so he would not be exalted above measure. Verse 8, For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Christ says, the way that you get the knowledge and charity that edifies, that's built upon the knowledge that you pray for in Ephesians chapter 1 and Ephesians chapter 3, the way you get that, that strength, inner strength of Christ, is it's made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, Will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me? Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. When I am weak physically, then I turn to the Lord. I turn to Scripture. I start reading and believing that. I'm not con if I'm good, doing good physically, then I may say, hey, I'm going to try to run a marathon, or I'm going to try to be a great athlete, or I'm going to use that physical endurance to get a big physically demanding job and make a lot of money, and I'm going to concentrate on this world. But if I get to the point where I am weak physically and can't do things, then I'm going to concentrate on the spiritual. So that's why Christ says my strength is made perfect in weakness. Spiritual strength of Christ is made perfect in our physical weakness. When I am weak physically, then am I strong? I am, that's an active way of saying it. Am I is a passive way. So I am weak physically, then am I strong? That's Christ being strong through me. So if anything, if we are to pray for people physically speaking, if anything, we should pray for infirmities, reproaches, necessities, persecutions, distresses. Because if that's because that may be what it takes for someone to be to believe the gospel, for them to come into the knowledge of the truth, for Christ to live in them. And certainly I'm not going to pray for somebody that they, you know, that they, oh, I hope they get this disease, or I hope they, you know, stub their toe, or, you know, I'm not going to pray for a physical thing like that, but isn't it better that we suffer physically so that Christ is strong through us than for us to be strong physically and then we don't have the strength of Christ in us because we're concentrating on the flesh? And that's the big problem when it comes to praying for people for physical because then we're concentrating on the physical. So if God brings a physical healing, now 
we just glory in that and we don't concentrate on the spiritual. Pentecostal type churches usually don't spend a lot of time studying and getting sound doctrine in their inner man because they're concentrating on physical healings. And if God doesn't bring a physical healing, well now I think that I've done something wrong or I haven't done something right and then I get all bummed out. Either way, whether I get healed or I don't get healed, by me concentrating on the physical, then, my con then that's all I'm looking at, regardless of the outcome, whether I get healed or not. Either way, I'm not looking at Scripture. But if I notice that my grace is sufficient for thee, my strength is made perfect in weakness, then when I get the physical ailment and the pain, certainly I don't want the pain, I don't like it, but when it happens, I'm not going to be bummed out about it. Instead, I'm going to say, well, this is an opportunity for Christ to be strong in me, which is why Paul says, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. Now, obviously, when something bad happened, he didn't like it. I mean, the fact that he got a thorn in the flesh, he prayed three times that it might depart from him. So it shows that he doesn't really enjoy physical ailments or pain. None of us do. But he looks at it in the long run, and he sees, well, this is working something good. The power of Christ rests upon me. So then I take pleasure in it for Christ's sake because it works out for my spiritual good. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 17. Or let's go back to verse 16. 2 Corinthians 4, 16. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, that's your physical ailments, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. That's why he can, Paul can take glory in these physical sufferings that he goes through, because even though his outward man is perishing, inwardly he's growing in it. He's, God's strength is made perfect in his weakness. For our light affliction which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. There's the glory that we read about in Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 3. That if we get the spirit of the wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, then you've got, the, then you've got Christ dwelling in your hearts by faith, rooted and grounded in love. Then you have the love of Christ which passeth knowledge. When you have that, it's all going to work out for a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, meaning the doctrine coupled with God's love working through you in heavenly places in that position that you're in, whatever position it is, works glory to Christ, which works glory to the Father, which indirectly works glory to you in heavenly places for all eternity. So that's why he says he doesn't like suffering, he doesn't like pain, but whatever suffering he does... It's light affliction. Verse 8, he says he is troubled on every side. He is perplexed. Verse 9, he says he is persecuted and that he is cast down. And verse 10, he says he is always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. Doesn't sound too light to me. But if he does that for 50 years, but yet it works an eternal weight of glory, then it is light compared to eternity. It's not light compared to how he suffered or what he felt. The suffering is light compared to 50 years of suffering and pain and agony is nothing compared to having eternity as a result of that pain, suffering for Christ's sake, the greater knowledge, the greater love coming through them in a position in heavenly places, working glory for God, in every action, everything that is done for all eternity. Eternity compared to 50 years is a lot longer. So, it's light affliction because it works a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. So what Paul says is for us to be followers of him. He says to get that sound doctrine in the inner man and allow the love of Christ to be developed upon it. And maybe you will suffer as a result of that. And in fact, it seems like we suffer more so that we don't get puffed up from the knowledge that we have. But yet that light affliction of that suffering 
where it's a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. There is greater glory brought to God the Father because we have the knowledge and the love of Christ coming through us to a greater extent for all eternity. And so, you know, you think of just like when you're doing a job. My grandfather, he didn't have a chance to go through and get a good education. He only got to the fifth grade. So he had to work a real hard job. and I mean, he survived and made it. But if he was able to go to college and get a degree, it would have been a lot easier road for him. He could have made more money. It would have been a less hard, physically speaking. And that would have lasted for his entire life until he retired. It's the same thing when it comes spiritually speaking. You can believe the gospel and be in heaven and it'll be a glorious thing. But if you get the more sound doctrine you get in the inner man, the better equipped you are to be in heavenly places. And so you can bring more glory to God in a higher position. Just like my grandfather could have done more in this life if he would have had a higher position in a company as opposed to having a low position due to his low education level. So it's the same thing for us spiritually. You can have a low spiritual education level and you're still going to be in heavenly places and it's still going to be glorious. But it'll be a far greater glory if you get the spirit of, of revelation, of the wisdom, revelation and the knowledge of Him. You get the sound doctrine in the inner man. You allow the love of Christ to be developed upon that through the sufferings that you go through. And it works a far more exceeding and eternal way to glory because you have a greater base to build on. You've got the greater knowledge, the greater love. And so you can be used to a greater extent by Christ in heavenly places. So that's what Paul is focusing on. When he prays, he focuses on the spiritual needs. So even if there are physical healings, and he's glad that Epaphroditus didn't die, and that he could send him to the Philippians. But it's better that they get built up in the inner man because then any knowledge and wisdom and doctrine and revelation of God's love that is an eternal thing Epaphroditus didn't die he got to live longer but guess what he eventually did die I don't know how much longer he lived even if God gave him 20-30 extra years compared to eternity that's nothing so Paul I would have us focus on praying for the spiritual, get our focus on the spiritual. Um, next time we will look at specifically, looking at uh, areas on how we should pray. Uh, dear Lord, we just thank you for giving us your word and the Holy Ghost to teach it to us. Help us to get out of the mindset of walking by sight, but just to trust in you and your word. And that when things aren't going well for us physically, not to get down in the dumps about that, but use it as an opportunity for your strength to be made perfect in our weakness. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.